Hi, welcome. My name's Joel. I'm looking forward to presenting these um, video series for you, looking at engagement and engagement planning. I've spent a lot of time working with community groups around Australia and in regional areas, looking at how they better engage communities um, to deliver their services or programs that they're offering. And Department of Regional Development are really keen to support the resource centres in building their ability to engage the communities. Now, in some regards, it sounds a bit, bit funny because from my experience with the CRCs, they're already engaging the communities. Yet, what we're going to work through in this series of videos is giving that a little bit more structure and a little bit more form to help ensure that the services you're delivering are directly reflected of what the community is saying they're wanting. And we're going to talk a bit about the blend between your community engagement activity and the community development outcomes that CRCs are delivering. But before we do that, let's just get some the housekeeping out of the way. Um, you should have already received a few different documents. Um, and if you haven't, don't worry, because you'll have this as a link to download. But there's this template, which is a, an engagement plan, essentially. And it's there for you. So you've got a bit of a guide as to how you're going to complete and what an engagement plan might look like. And during these course of videos, what we're going to work with is a little known CRC, um, they're just west of Carnarvon called Bungle Yup, and we've already done an engagement plan for them. So I'm going to introduce you to them as we go through, and you'll be able to walk through and see what a completed engagement plan uh, can begin to look like. But that's enough of the housekeeping work. The overall purpose of these series of videos is we really want to explore and unpack those kind of fundamentals of planning community engagement. Um, as I said, CRCs naturally do some really amazing work engaging the communities already. And what we're wanting to do is just provide a bit more structure to that so you can ensure that you've got the, the confidence that you're actually maximising the benefit that comes from community engagement done really, really well. The course of the actual videos um, is going to be broken up into a few sections. This video, um, we're going to actually have a look at some of the what is community engagement. We're going to look at why you might engage, and we're going to look at, well, what does quality engagement look like? Then we want to actually start getting into the planning. As you can kind of see, we're going to take um, five key steps through the planning process, and I won't go through those in detail now. I'll introduce those a little bit later on. But they're the steps that you're going to see in your engagement plan. Um, so what we cover on the video is, is all laid out to match the engagement plan that you've got. So. Really, all we can do is kick off um, and have a look at this thing called what, is it, what engagement might be. And really, it's lots of different things for lots of different people. And I've been really fortunate to work with quite a range of different organisations, sectors, settings around Australia and also some work internationally with the UN. And what's amazing for me is the process that we're going through over these videos actually applies regardless of the community you're working with or the issue you're dealing with. It's just the level of complexity that may, that may change as far as how, how much you go into each area. But if we look at then what engagement is, um, I guess the first overarching thing to begin to consider is that CRCs already do engagement, as I've said, and they do engagement for a community development outcome. They're actually trying to improve the cap capacity, capability, connectedness of the community whether that be through socially, whether that be through access to government information, a whole range of really amazing services. And then there's also the communications work, which is about you know, the messages you send out to people and how you help make sure that people know about the great work you're doing. So when we're looking at community engagement, we're really um, bringing together those three different areas. The processes by which you're going to go out to the community, the engagement, the community development, the kinds of outcomes you're trying to achieve and building those connections and networks and the communication, the messages you're going to use as you do all of them. So they all kind of overlap quite, quite strongly. But if we're going to look at community engagement, I guess we'd better start with a good old definition. IAP2, uh, International Association of Public Participation. I'm one of their licensed trainers and ambassadors and they're basically, and a member of, of the association, and they're basically the the, the professional body for people that, that do engagement and community engagement across a range of sectors. 
and this is their definition out of their certificate training for what they see as engagement. And yep, it's a long definition, I'll, I'll grant you that, and each time we've tried to reduce it, it's become pretty hard. But let's have a look at maybe some of the key elements of that definition. Engagement essentially is a planned process. There's lots of things that happen organically and that's okay, but we actually go out for a planned process, uh, in a planned way, for a specific purpose. And that purpose is often to shape the decisions or the actions of the community or the organisation. So we can actually go out for a number of different reasons and it relates to a specific problem, opportunity or outcome. So there's work you might do that's about relationship building, but when we're talking about engagement, we're talking about going out there for a planned purpose um, within, in, in a way that actually is looking at a specific kind of outcome and in a way they're actually looking to offer influence so that the community is actually having an opportunity to shape the decision making of your organisation. And that's what uh, IAP2 considers engagement. So it's a pretty broad church and there's lots of different things that could come under that as a definition. So before we get into the how you engage, I thought I'd introduce you to my top four reasons why you might want to consider an engagement approach. Um, and this is just a way of maybe building a bit of common language as to why investing the time in planning your engagement, it could be a worthwhile investment. So here it is, number one, that going it alone doesn't build capacity. We know that CRCs are here to build capacity and work with their local communities. So the need to build capacity is super important. What I wanted to introduce to you is two decision-making models. And each of those models has a certain impact on community's capacity for decision-making. So here's the first one. It's called Decide, Announce, Defend. The acronym, DAD. It's paternalistic for a reason. Um, it's basically, we're going to decide what's best for you, we're going to announce what's best for you, and then we're going to defend our decision um, until you kind of either agree with us or you then force us to change our mind. Now I know no CRCs work like that, but certainly many organisations work in that mode. They work very much in the DAD mode. And if you can consider what happens to, well, maybe even if we take it back, can I get you to imagine for a moment a child that's grown up in an environment where every single decision has been made for them. Even if the parents are loving, they make it really, really clear in no uncertain terms that it's their house and their rules. And even as the child gets older and they actually begin to you know, want to wield their own decision-making capability, that actually they get told really clearly, no, no, we're the adults, we know best. I'm just interested for you to think for a moment about how might that child, what behaviours might you see in that child as they grow into adulthood? And when I, when I play with this example with groups, the two, the two behavioural types that people kind of talk about most is they say that, well, on one hand, they might get this child who actually begins to just go with the flow, look for people to make all the decisions for them, want to check in, want to check out, um, and just basically look to be compliant. Problems are other people's problems. They're just there to kind of do what they're told to do. And then, which is, which is a bit of an extreme. And on the other extreme, you've got the child that might actually be there to be super rebellious, to rattle the cage, to push back at all, at all opportunities because they don't really trust what's going on. So the interesting thing when people uh, talk to me about engagement planning, the two things they ask me is either, how do we get people interested? Or, how do we stop them shouting at us? So it's possible that when organisations default too much to a decide, announce, defend approach, that, that approach, that they actually create communities that aren't comfortable with decision making, that they're hard to engage, or that they're actually becoming a little bit agitated and they just don't trust what's going on. So there's got to be an alternative. And the alternative is the engagement approach. And that's referred to as the PEP approach, yeah, which is about profiling, trying to work out who are the people that need to be involved in this conversation? Who are the people that are affected? And we'll talk about how we work that out later on. Um, we want to have a look at educating, and that education is often two-way. 
we learn often as much from the community as they learn from us. And then participating. How do we actually include people in the decision making process? So if you go back to that child and imagine them for a moment where they're actually the ones that actually, they may not get their way all the time because after all children don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of life. But where they're able to, they're able to have some influence. Um, if you begin to project forward, how would you imagine that child might begin to deal with uncertainty and change if they've been given the opportunity to win some and to lose, lose some as, they, as they've gone through? Which is why engagement actually builds capacity. Because you get communities that are used to not necessarily, they don't have the anxiousness of it's somebody else's problem and they don't have the, the, the lack of trust of, you know, I'm going to control as much as I've been controlled in the past. So engagement, the, the philosophically, I guess, is where we're starting. Engagement actually delivers some fairly deep outcomes in terms of community capacity and change. How we do that is where we're, is where we're going to go. This is a very, very quick example, and I'll show you this, this reaction of community in action. If you check out the time of this, June 20, this was at a time when Victoria was low in water, and you can see this is what the Premier of the day actually announced um, when he was interviewed outside the front of um, Parliament. We announced it yesterday, and we're consulting now. So pretty classic decide, announce, defend approach. But here's the interesting thing. Look at the, the anti-desal campaign and it's July 12th. So within two weeks of going that, that approach, that government actually faced themselves with an absolute pushback of an anti-campaign. And what's really interesting is actually there's really good science behind why this happens. It's actually not an accident that people get upset. I was doing some work, um, some change management work with out of home care, so foster, ki foster kids and children in care. And I was working with a psychologist who shared with me this research. The fact that physical pain and social exclusion is actually coded in the same part of the brain. So you whack somebody over the head with a stick or you leave them out of something that they feel they need to be a part of, it actually fires up as the same, in the same part of their brain. So that's pretty significant when it comes to engagement, that if people are feeling left out, they're actually less likely to be interested or accept what it is that you're sharing with them. So what that means is if you've got an issue that you're wanting to get people talking about, you actually only have two choices. Choice number one is that you could create an invited space. So imagine for a moment that um, there are people that you've had maybe some disagreements with or that you're trying to build a bit of a relationship with um, but you haven't really been able to get on the same page. So you invite them over for dinner. And even though you might not know them, what's your sense of how, would they like, how are they likely to walk in the door? There might be some trepidation. There might even be a bit of unease. But more often than not, they at least walk in polite. There's at least a level of social norms that they follow. And the interesting thing is, who gets to choose where people sit around the table? More often than not, it's the host. And who gets to choose what the meal is? More often than not, it's the host. So with an invited space, you end up with a really interesting scenario where you're inviting people in that you may have had disagreements with or you're trying to build relationships with and already they're more open to hearing what you've got to say and you can do it in a structure that actually suits you and suits the conversation that you're trying to have better because you're the one that places the table, you're the one that determines what the meal is. But you're sitting down to that meal and you're having a great kind of chow down and as you're about to kind of get go for that second or third spoonful, you start hearing some banging on the windows and banging on the doors and you look up and you realise that there are people that you've actually forgotten to invite. And so you go, don't worry, I'll just ignore them, don't worry, we'll just keep going the way we, where we're going. But the banging gets louder. So there are people that you haven't in invited, which means you've actually moving people into an insisted space. 
Eventually, you open the door. How do those people walk into, the, into your room? Where do those people sit? What do those people eat? And the crazy thing is, it's the same people. The, there are people who want to be involved in the conversations that you're having as, as a community group and as a community service. And simply by not inviting them in, you push them to become in the insisted space. So in many regards, the choice is you're dealing with the same people. It's just how you want to deal with them. The third reason why I think engagement is an important bet is that the studies and the research is really clear on this, that the things, the ha the things that actually um, harm people, the risks that make people you know, either sick or cost them financially, etc., and the things that make people upset are actually different. I'll get you to have a bit of a, a read of this, this um, newspaper article for a second. So in the article you've got a lady who's really concerned about the sound of the jackhammers on her unborn child while smoking a cigarette. Now, which is a really classic kind of example of the fact that the things that we get that actually harm us are different to the things that upset us. And so that's something we need to take into consideration because in many, many, in many organisations people go, you know what, the things that we're doing Actually, it's not having a big impact on the community. It's not going to harm them anyway. In fact, we actually think it's going to benefit them. But that actually has no bearing on whether it's going to make people upset. There's different analysis that you need to do to work out if that's going to be the case. And again, we'll talk about that later on as we go through. And my fourth reason is the classic, the emperor's new clothes, the fact that humans have at least, at least, 107 different biases for decision making. If you've invested a lot of money in a project, you are more likely to think it's a good project and less likely to want to stop it, even if it's failing. We've got plenty of them and none of us are devoid of them. So we need to kind of take that into consideration in fact that more, the more diverse voices we have in the room helps to make sure that those thinking biases don't influence us too much. Here's a few examples. We all know Bill Gates. Back in 1981, this was his quote. Now, if you don't know a megabyte from a gigabyte from a terabyte, 640 kilobytes, probably about the size of an email address, maybe with a very small kind of attachment. Um, and for him in 81, that was all the memory you're going to need. Well, check out this date, 1899. Yeah, the commissioner of the US patents basically said everything that's been invented has been invented. Possibly some thinking biases coming in here. So here it is, my quick summary before we move on to some of the, uh, some of the, the other elements of engagement planning. This for me is the perfect summary of what engagement is all about. No, I haven't been bored one night and scanning kind of lol cats, but if you imagine that somebody somewhere probably in the wee small hours of the morning, was sitting there and they thought, brilliant, I'm going to take this lemon or lime, fashion it into a helmet, I'm going to put it on my cat, I'm going to take a photo, it's going to be awesome. What I'm not really sure about though is whether they asked the cat. And essentially, that's what engagement is about. Engagement is about recognising that we come up with great ideas with really good intentions in mind, but unless we've asked the cat, we can end up with the community giving us a face much like this cat has given us. So hopefully that was a bit of a useful in introduction to engagement for you, and or primarily the why of engagement. And where we're going to go to next is the how we begin to plan engagement with a quick and a brief pause at quality engagement. So I'll see you really soon um, on some of the other videos.